Romans chapter 9. Verses 14 through 18. Romans 9. Verses 14. What shall we say to him? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. But he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for, that, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, in that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole so then he, God, has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God. The scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. For God has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. I want to preach this morning from the subject, the mercy of God. You may have your seats. Thank you very much, ushers, for two kind. The mercy, the mercy of God. Hashtag unmerited faith. Did I get my hashtag right? Been working on it all week. In the late 1800s, Thomas Edison and his team of highly intelligent men had finally discovered how to construct a long-lasting light bulb. intelligent men had finally discovered how to construct, how to build a long-lasting light bulb. I'm stressing the fact that Thomas Edison and his team of highly intelligent men were the first to discover how to build a long-lasting light bulb because many people attribute the first light bulb to Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was not the first person to discover a light bulb. He was the first person 
them to discover a long lasting life book. But with this amazing discovery, with this world changing discovery came the laborsome task of constructing the life book in which it was estimated that it took approximately 24 hours to construct, get it, one light bulb. In order to have a long lasting light bulb, you would have had to wait 24 hours to just get it. one. It's Thomas Edison and his team of highly intelligent men prepared to debut their long lasting light bulb. They spent the required 24 hours to get the light bulb together. And after the 24 hour period and the light bulb had finally been constructed, Thomas Edison called one of the young men and placed the light bulb into his possession in order for him to carry the light bulb up the flight of stairs for safekeeping. Realizing how valuable this light bulb was, the young man who Thomas Edison placed the light bulb in his hands watched every step when he got to the staircase, he made sure he gathered himself properly and made sure the light bulb was well secured. Step by step, he made sure this light bulb that took 24 hours to make was well secured. But when he got to the top of the steps, he missed his step and tripped over his own two feet. Causing the light bulb that took 24 hours to shatter the moment it hit the ground. But without missing a beat, Thomas Edison and his team of highly intelligent men went back to work, spending another 24 hours to construct another light bulb. After the 24 hour period had passed, to everyone's surprise, Thomas Edison called the same young man that had dropped the previous light bulb. And he put the newly constructed light bulb back into his possession. Before you start to think, what in the world was wrong? with Thomas Edison. Why in the world would he put the, uh, a newly constructed light bulb in the hands of the person who just dropped the previous light bulb? What sense does that make? But before you start to criticize Thomas Edison for the mercy that he showed that young man, I need for you to understand that the same mercy that Thomas Edison showed
knew what to say and rubbed the red button past the preach. God is full of mercy and he keeps giving it to me every morning. But I've got a question. I, I, how, do I, how do I receive the mercy of God? Here in our respective text, I believe the Holy Spirit makes known to us how it is when you and I can receive the mercy of God. Oh, you interested? In order to receive the mercy of God, you must first understand that mercy belongs to God. In order to receive the mercy of God, you must first understand that mercy belongs. To God. If you grace us with your presence on last week, then properly you remember that I preached a sermon entitled Saved by Grace. And it was in that little sermon that the Holy Spirit allowed us to raise the question why should you and I depend on God for salvation? And it was in there that we learned that both you and I should depend on God for salvation because the word of God cannot fail. And then we learned that you and I should depend on God for salvation not only because the word of God cannot fail, but we learned that God has a plan. And it was in that little point about God having a plan that we learned something called election. And that is when God has a plan, he chooses who he will to do what he will, however he will, he has nothing to do with works. And it's based on that argument that Paul opens Romans chapter 9 verse 14 with the rhetorical question, what shall we say then? Is there injustice with God? Okay. Paul answers in the most emphatic way possible. God forbid. Uh, that, that, that's a Greek way of just saying the English no. Is there any injustice in God? word injustice here in the text. Maybe you read from the King James Version and you see something like unjust. Or are you reading another kind of translation and you see a word called unrighteous. I don't care what translation you read, the Greek word there is adikia. It literally means to be out of harmony with what is right and what is wrong. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, Paul anticipate that his readers are asking, is God out of harmony with what it means to be right and what it means to be wrong? Does God have any idea how the world works? Uh, because a bad person is not supposed to be blessed according to world standards. And a good person is supposed to be prosperous according to 
no injustice in God. But the scripture says, or God says to Moses, that I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion on. Word mercy here, ladies and gentlemen, literally means to have pity on. It means to feel sorry for. Oh, here's what I like. It, it, it means to give you what you don't deserve. God said, I will give my undeserving forgiveness to whomever I decide to give my undeserving forgiveness to. And I don't want to give my undeserving forgiveness to whomever I decide to give my undeserving forgiveness to. I will give my compassion. Essentially, in the English, we use the word mercy and compassion interchangeably. Sometimes we'll say compassion, sometimes we'll say mercy, but in English, we simply mean the same thing. But in the Greek, the words are not used interchangeably. Mercy means mercy, compassion means compassion. Compassion is the emotion that leads to the act of mercy. Let me say it again. Compassion is the emotion that leads to the act of mercy. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, you can have, you cannot have mercy without having compassion. But you can Did you get 
get that? Let me translate it for you, real simple. God don't care nothing about what you want. <laughs> God don't care nothing about what you want. It doesn't depend on your will. It doesn't depend on what you want God to do for you. But on God who has mercy. Word God that comes from the Greek word theos. The definition of God is not important here, but what is important is the grammatical features that surround the word God. The grammatical features that surround the word God is simply the fact that God is a noun. It's used in what is called the genitive case. A noun used in the genitive case does several things. It can describe something about the action or here, it simply shows what the noun possesses. In other words, when he says God is the one who has mercy, the writer is simply trying to get us to understand that God is the one who mercy belongs to. Mercy belongs to God. If God was a kid, he would say, mine, because mercy belongs to God. And because mercy belongs to God, God is welcome to do with mercy whatever he wants to do with mercy, which means if God wants to show mercy to this side of the room, but he doesn't want to show mercy to that side of the room, you both can praise God when you understand that mercy belongs to God. Did you hear what I said? Did you really hear what I said? The person who God heals can praise God, and the person who God doesn't heal can praise God when you understand that mercy belongs to God. Yes. 